What's up, Warport family? It is your boy, C-Dub. With A-Day now in the books, how should Auburn fans feel about this year's football team? We will discuss that, the stats, and what we observed in A-Day game and more in today's edition of the Weekend Tailgate. This is the Weekend Tailgate. Brought to you by Golden Cast Iron. I do Be You are now listening to Happy Sunday, everyone, and welcome to the Weekend Tailgate, courtesy of show sponsor Golden's Cast Iron. I want to send a special thanks to them for partnering with the War Rapport on numerous of different projects that we've had. Thank you for being a sponsor of today's show. Guys, support us by supporting our sponsors. So head over to goldenscastiron.com forward slash WR, where you can use code GETYOURWEIGHTUP to get 15% off weights if you're trying to build muscle or lose weight, or if you just want to have a good time with family, friends, around a nice fire pit or Kamado grill, use code TWR to get $65 off of either of those products. Special thanks again to Golden's Cast Iron for being a partner with the Warpour and a sponsor for today's show. Do us a favor and share this video on social media in your group chats, wherever people can observe and gather content auburn content please share that smash that like button and subscribe if you're new to the channel ike's got some film to review about a day ike's going to break all of this down you definitely want to catch that so if you don't have a green name ike how can they get that it's real simple you click the join button uh first and foremost we're going to be breaking down just how uconn beat alabama in the uh final four <laughs> and yes. Then, <laughs> yes 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 start off your sunday with some petty <laughs> oh <laughs> no i'm just kidding i didn't i don't even oh, I didn't record oh, that game. are you joking oh man. yeah i'm not gonna i'm not I, i'm not gonna rewatch that game There's we should no do point. that we yeah. should do that yeah. i mean yeah. if you guys really want now listen if enough people say they want to see it, I will go and I will do a review. Who is not going to want to see that. If you're a patron, if you're a patron, listen. This is why you signed up. I can now. I can now start watching the tournament now. This is why you signed up for yeah. patron membership. We will give oh, you man. detailed breakdown, petty. <laughs> Look at how this motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. the, hey, grab a rebound. The, 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 the watch the film starts off in the second half when they start. <laughs> mm -hmm. you now, I'm gonna start it in now, the first half and tell you, listen, this was luck right here. There, this this is not gonna stay <laughs> happening this way. Let me tell you why this was a bad shot that he just happened to make. Um. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So you can get in here with the green name, man, and we will definitely talk all things a day. And if you guys really want to break down the loss of Bama in the Final Four, I'd be happy to oblige you with that film review. Uh, but you got to click the join button to get in on that. You can give the membership to somebody else. If you want someone else to join in on the Petty Parade, I have no problems. Gift them a membership, a free month of that. We'll get in here and we'll talk about that stuff as well. Listen to the network, man. All the guys are going to be giving their thoughts on all things. We need to get some women on the show. I keep saying all the guys. There are no women a part of the War Report Podcast Network. I need a, a female voice in here to um, balance sure. out all this uh, whatever we got going on. Testosterone. So, yeah, man. Let's yeah. figure out that. Like uh, speaking like of testosterone, you know, drop your nuts <laughs> and uh, <laughs> get in here with Manscaped. Nah. Um uh, code rapport gets you 15 percent plus free shipping on all that stuff and if you want to bet on uconn uh because they are now your favorite team left in the final four head to bet us right now the uh the, the link will be in our description of how you can use our code to get in and that'll get you 125 percent sign up bonus up 2500 dollars at betus.com and we definitely appreciate you all for sponsor or supporting the sponsors of the war of war all right, gentlemen, listen, let's get into it. Uh, let's talk about the spring game. I didn't know if you guys wanted, before we get into statistics and begin to talk about different aspects of this team and how they performed, uh, real quick, Ike, Mike, you were there covering it in person. You got to take in the atmosphere for A-Day. You got good weather this time for A-Day. Uh, your thoughts overall in terms of how the day went and just what you observed? Oh uh, yeah, it was 
beautiful. And and last year it was rainy and it was cold and fans were standing in the breezeways just trying to stay dry. So uh, uh, the good Lord blessed us with some great weather yesterday at Jordan Hare Stadium. Uh, I don't want to brag, guys, but the media had a contest to guess how many would be. I don't want to brag, and I'm about to brag. <laughs> <laughs> you know this. Don't girl. you love that part? I, not to be uh, disrespectful, but here comes uh, a lot yeah, of disrespect. Yeah. So, um, uh, 33,526 people showed up to A Day yesterday, and I thought that was a pretty, really good turnout. Um, so, fans showed up. Uh, you know, they gave fans a lot of reasons to show up. Um, so, like I said, uh, 33,526. My guess was 33,410, Caesar. <laughs> so, uh, definitely got the closest there. But, look, um, it was. I thought it was a good day. Um, they, they passed the ball actually significantly more than they ran it. So, it was clear that they were trying to evaluate the passing game. We're going to take a look at some of those numbers here in a second. Uh, but I, I thought it was a good step towards figuring out what you have. Um, some guys were injured and set out yesterday, uh, so that sucked. But ultimately, you know, you got to see, like, listen, man, you you found out yesterday, think about it, you found out yesterday that if your kicker goes down, you got a dude who can come in and make, like, a 69-yard. Yeah. Mission nice. accomplished yesterday, right? Like, I mean, I like I said, I, I thought some guys got opportunities to show what they could do, and, and that's what eight is for. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I Any thoughts, man, before we get into – because. Uh, Mike kind of uh, teed us off with uh, field goals, but any thoughts before we get into that? I, uh, I mean, I enjoyed the format of the more than I thought I would. Uh, it was entertaining, right? Like it, it made the the competition I think really good because there was like when you're just playing one team versus another team, like it doesn't really give you an opportunity to really see who won. But like saying, okay, defense, you got to stop them. And like it showed, the competitiveness started to show. It was like an all-star game where it's like towards the end, it's like you could see people being like, all right, I don't actually want to lose here. So let's mm-hmm. just start start doing some different stuff. DJ Durkin was being a little – he's being a little feisty out there with the blitz packages and stuff. I liked it, man. So I think it gave an yeah. opportunity for guys to really uh, show some passion out there. And I, I really want to um, – them to continue to figure out ways to inject that into this team. Free said that the defensive line Ike had been getting after the offense all, you know, spring practice. And I think they showed that again, uh, forcing the quarterbacks to make decisions. And, you know, that's what's going to happen in SEC play. People are going to force you to make decisions. So simulating that in your spring game is a good idea. Um, If you haven't watched the mix that we dropped, you know, I talked with Josh Pate because he's traveling around doing all these spring games about how important are these spring games like what should we take away from a spring game if guys are terrible is that terribleness going to carry over into the season or could that be a precursor for figuring out some things and it looking better um we'll take a look at the numbers and and, you know i'd be interested to hear what you guys think about what we saw yesterday and what will translate and what won't well let's look at field goal kicking yeah pretty perfect i must say uh an amazing day for towns uh he was seven for seven, the long of 58, which they actually moved him up to make the kick, but they probably could have kept him where he was. He could have made that from 65. Yeah, he was, he, it was all good. Mm. Uh, it feel again, it feels good to know that we have two reliable kickers. Um, one point that I wanted to make, and I'll tee this up to you, Ike. Uh, I made I made mention of this yesterday when B, me and B Will and Dustin were on. It almost seems like we can find out who needs to handle kickoffs and who needs to handle field goals. But your your thoughts on what you saw, Ike, in terms of the kicking yesterday? Yeah, I mean, listen, um, the kicker was perfect, so you can't be better than that. <laughs> um, and uh, he was poised in the big situation. He showed a little passion himself after hitting the long one at the end. Um, so I like all of the things that I saw from the kicking, um, and I'm hoping that translates to big Saturdays coming up here this fall for Auburn because they're going to need it if the um, offense is going to be, you know, moving the ball between the twenties and then stalling out. You don't need the kicker to, to do some things. So hopefully they can figure out the red zone offense so it becomes a extra point fest for these young men. But you know you've got a guy who can make it from distance, which 
you know, you had that last season, but now you've got two guys who can do that. And as you said, potentially, you know, you can utilize one of them as a field goal kicker and one of them as uh, somebody who can kick it into the end zone consistently. I'd love to see that. As you know, I get frustrated watching kickers not kick the ball into the end zone on a kickoff. That just, Absolutely. I don't understand it. Absolutely. And whatever issues you may have in kickoff coverage gets easily exposed when your kicker can't do that. Yeah. Uh, Mike, your thoughts about the field goal kicking and, and, and just how you feel about the kicking game overall? Uh, yeah, look, I, I'm excited about the, the long ones, but I'm telling you what Pause. what gave <laughs> what gave me <laughs> the most excitement was everything from 40 <laughs> yards in, right? Like, th- those are the games, those are the kicks that really make or break your 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 game. When you're struggling on offense and your kicker goes out there and misses a 30-yarder, and he made uh, three, you know, under uh, three in the 30s. He had one there from 26 yards. Those are the, to me, those are the kicks that make or break your game. Making consistent kicks from regular distances is important. Accuracy. How often are they going to let him kick one from 58? Well, they they might do it more often now that they've seen that he can do it in a game like situation. But the truth is the majority of the kicks that your kicker is going to have is going to be 40 yards or in. And you want to know that he can hit those sorts of kicks from different angles. You know, there was a little bit of wind out there, Ike, Mm -hmm. yesterday. Um, So, you know, he had to account for some wind yesterday and uh, put you on the scoreboard. Right. Like, I mean, think about LSU. What was it? 2007. With a kick fest. They went down. Well, I missed kick six them. kicks. Yeah. When Kenny Irons put up 200. Yeah, and, I remember. And lost in overtime. Jeez. Ugh. So you give this kicker six kicks and you you maybe win by three scores. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know, man. Like I said, they may, they may struggle some on offense because, you know, we'll get into a red zone offense did look great. So having a kicker who can come in and nail these uh, is a huge weapon if you ask me. Uh, let's get into the next phase. B, I didn't know if you had any thoughts about kicking before oh, we move no. on. No, okay. no, no. Uh, rushing. Let's talk about the rushing, uh, the rushing game in the spring game. Now, I think Mike, you said it, the emphasis was on the passing game, which I think that that was a correct thing to focus on. Let's look at what the numbers showed for the rushing attack here. Uh, Damari Austin was the lead rusher. Uh, also, had the most rushes in the game. He looked good at, at points. He had a nice 13-yard uh, rush, uh, but six carries for 21, averaging three and a half carries. Thorne actually had the highest average, uh, being able to run four attempts, 20 yards. Jeremiah Cobb averaged two yards per carry, 12 yards on six attempts. Let's talk. I think this is a good opportunity to segue the rushing stats into how the front seven of the Auburn defense looked. And this is one of the things that throughout the spring, Hugh Freeze talked about the defense actually uh, having a lot of success with the offense. Should Auburn fans be encouraged by how the defense look, considering that there's been concerns about depth along the defensive front? I'll start with you, Ike. Um, I don't know that there's a necessarily a, here, here's the thing I will say about the rush offense. Um, it was pretty predictable and you saw the the early in the game when Thorne kept. Yeah. The defense was keying in on the fact that quarterbacks probably aren't going to run very much. And so it was a little bit easier to know run scenarios and what was going to happen in, uh, when it was the RPO uh, situations. Uh, so I'm not as worried. Now, it is cause for concern if it's going to look that bad and the quarterback is live and he has the ability to run. Um, Or if you're going to be playing a quarterback that is not a runner as the starter, then you need to figure out how to block that up a little bit better or what your RPO pass game is going to look like a little bit better. Uh, But the way that they were able to rotate defensive linemen in that game and, uh, you know, they were running a little bit of tempo, but not too much. I'm not super concerned about where we are. I mean, it's always been a thing where I think they're going to need more depth in, in the interior of that defensive line. Uh, but the D-line looked good. And, um, you know, that offensive line is still a work in progress for sure. Uh, but I'm not I'm not panicking over that right now, no. Mike, your, your, your thoughts about what you saw? Uh, okay, so hear me out on this. This is one of those things that I'm – talking about when I say, does this really 
uh, translate over into the fall? Does this is what I saw? Does it worry me? Does the rush game worry me from what I saw on Saturday? I don't think so. Like I'm not. I'm not that. I, it, I think it needs some work. It was clear that the defensive line was in the backfield, dis- disrupting the rush game quite a bit. Uh, but look, man, Jarquez Hunter is not a f- second year back, man. Like, you know, Demari Alston has got experience in the system. Brian Batia is, is an experienced guy. Um, I'll tell you what did concern me about the rush game was uh, the hold that Dylan Wade had that set them behind the chains. And, you know, this is where your rush game will suffer. If you get behind the right. chains on first and second down, you got to put the ball in the quarterback's hands and, you know, you got to take, you know, uh, carries out of the running back's hands. So staying on schedule, I think with the play calling, probably more important, but it was clear to me that they weren't really trying to do much to evaluate the run game in this one. It felt like to me, can we put the numbers back up? I'm sorry. Can we put the numbers back up? Um, If you look at it, right, you had 31 carries, which, which is a, decent amount i guess uh but you know when we get to the passing you'll see you know how how that ended up panning out uh but you had jarquez hunter with four carries like come on man like we're not really evaluating a rush game where jarquez hunter had four carries but he had one carry you know alston got alston and cobb the guys that you really are you don't have as much tape on your you're trying to evaluate they got some carries uh and then you know thorns numbers in a spring game, we don't know what those mean, so just throw those out. So it doesn't look great by the numbers, but are you looking at this and you're saying that Auburn's rush game is a disaster, they're not going to be able to run the ball in the fall? I don't think that's what you take away from this. It just wasn't set up for there to be huge numbers here. And if they had run all over them, again, we don't have a, a stat for the defense. Everybody would have been sitting here saying our defensive line sucks and you know we're not going to be able to stop anybody. Q Free said this. He said that you're not really left guys with a great feeling when one side dominates. <laughs> so you never know. Are we really that good on one side of the ball and that bad or vice versa or what's going on? I think that these are proven. We know Jeremiah Cobb is good. We know Alston is good. If anything, I maybe have some questions about how the offensive line will block for these guys. But as far as the running backs are concerned, I, I think Auburn is as solid as they can be here. You're, you're muted, Caesar. Thoughts? Any thoughts? Be on on to add to this? No, I mean I agree with both of those guys. I, I don't think the run game was the focus here yesterday. It was about seeing the quarterbacks make decisions, and that's mostly what we got to see. So I, I mean, you still have to feed the running backs, but they went to very deep on the depth chart for the running backs. So it was obvious that hey, the top three guys get 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 stretched out and take a hit or two, and then you're done for the day. I don't think the the run game and what it can be was on display yesterday. Uh, I agree. I agree with that. Uh, to me, I don't think this was as much of an indictment on the rushing attack as much as it was. I was pleased to see that in a scrimmage where you've seen this offense for weeks, three to four weeks, you know what they're doing. You should be able to stop it. Now, right. now, Caesar, I will tell you, the division of carries is something that I expect to see in the fall, though, here. Okay. Right? Like your quarterback with four rushes, uh, you know, obviously these numbers will be elevated during an actual game. But, sure. you know, uh, you got a couple running backs with about the same amount of touches. And uh, I don't, Thorne said he doesn't expect to run the ball as much this year. But if what we saw on Saturday holds true, I don't know that he gets away from it. He might have to run the ball. No, it's uh, a part of uh, his game. It's yeah, a part of his game. Right. Because you got he's got to keep the, the, the defense honest in a lot of ways. And. Unless Hugh Freeze is changing something about his system, I think we've seen guys that you, they need that to be effective. Uh, 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 you know, if you want to be a run play action team, you well, that first part of that you got to be able to do. Well, the Q, the QBs in Hugh Freeze's offense, um, maybe except the first QB that he had at Liberty, um, they ran the ball quite a bit. They factored into the rushing attack, so I don't I don't see how Peyton Thorne doesn't factor into Auburn's rushing attack this upcoming season. Even if he may, even if the goal is for him to run less, he is still very much a part of the rushing attack. Yeah, I agree. Look, I mean, uh, the run game will be instrumental. If, if you watch us, you know, last year Auburn had a sixty-one thirty-nine run to pass ratio. 61% runs. Now, a big part of that was your quarterback having over 100 rush attempts on the season. 
Yeah. Without Peyton running the ball at that clip, you're maybe a little closer to, I think, 55-45. But that's what Hugh Freeze wants. Ike and I did uh, a drop where we look at the balance of run to pass over the years in the Hugh Freeze offense. And, you know, in the years that it's been better, it's been closer. To, it's it's still been more run than pass, but it's been a little closer to 50-50 or just slightly more, you know, between, you know, 2 to 3% more on on the run side. Uh, they want to be able to control the clock. I, I, it's just, is has there been a big time like NFL back that's come out of a Hugh Freeze system? Like, no, I don't, I don't think, so. I don't yeah, think I that he's think like, so. yeah, they're, they're really not known for it. But again, he, I think he's got better talent here at that position than he's had at a lot of his other stops. So I'll be interested to see can somebody step up and shine the way that they're going to set this system up? How much do they lean into the hot hand? If let's say Jarquez starts the season on fire. Buddy is busting 150 a game. Will Hugh Freeze give Jarquez more carries because that's what's working, or will they try to force balance next year? Uh, is something that I'll be interested to see how that works. Uh, Jonathan Taylor asks, and I'm going to stop here before we go to the next segment. He asks, can Brian Petit have a chance to be a big part of the offense? Uh... I mean, I don't think so. I, I think that his his biggest contribution for Auburn this season is going to be in the special teams, special teams. maybe some some third down situational stuff. Um, but uh, as far as a big part of the offense, unless they're going to run more two back sets, then no. Yeah, I, I agree. see it right now. Okay. Yeah, and, I, and even if it's two back sets, I mean, I actually see Jeremiah Cobb getting on the field, even in those. In my opinion. Yeah, I like I said, he came back. Um, but how many opportunities will he get if everyone stays healthy? I, like I, I with like I think his biggest contributions will be on special teams. All right, gentlemen, listen. Let's let's talk. Let's talk receivers mm -hmm. and what we saw there. I'm going to pull up the stats. You guys, Ike has watched this twice. He was there in person. Uh, the leading receiver for the uh, receiving core was actually the transfer. Mr. Lewis had five receptions, 73 yards. Uh, longest, uh, a 40-yard rece yard reception, followed by the guy who pretty much was the MVP of the offensive MVP, Cam Coleman, four receptions, 92 yards, and a score. Uh, Camden Brown had three receptions for 45 yards. He looked good out there. Sam Jackson caught a couple, uh, followed by Will Upton, uh, Saw Gentry get a catch. A uh, few guys out here, uh, some running backs. Petit caught, caught a pass out the backfield. Uh, Brandon Frazier caught a pass. Fairweather was targeted. Thoughts on what we saw with the receivers who uh, leading was starting with Robert Lewis, but your thoughts on the receiving core. I'll start with you, Ike. Uh, I think the receiving core stepped up in this game. Um, the things that I was looking for, that I was looking at and looking for for them from this game were just – you know, are you able to be where you need to be, right? Like less miss assignments early in the spring um, this time around. You didn't get to throw the ball last time during the game, but you you haven't heard the repeated refrain of uh, refrain, excuse me, of missed assignments this spring. So guys are coming in and still learning, but being more accountable for where they need to be. And then, you know, how often are guys who are open dropping the ball? Didn't see a ton of drops. It's not from your top end of the receiving core um you saw some from some of the you know walk-ons and such but th those are guys that you aren't going to be expecting a lot from in the fall and then do you have the big play ability as far as being able to make yards after the catch or get separation in the open field you saw that from the receivers in this one as well um and i do think our dbs played well so it's not as if they're going against some guys who can't cover um so overall i think the wide receiver core looks good uh are they drastically better than next uh, last year? I, I don't know. It's too early for me to say that. But overall, I think look good. I'm I, the guy I'm most proud of, and maybe it's because you know we've developed somewhat of a relationship with him over the last year. Is Cam Brown? Uh, you know, he really I think is working very hard to defeat whatever things are being said about him and block that out and just go out there and perform. And I think he did a good job of doing that Saturday. Mike, your thoughts on the receiving core and what you saw? What stood out for you? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, you saw everybody tweeting before this game, by stocking Cam Coleman. Uh, there's a reason why they said that, because they definitely were going to make sure Cam Coleman had a day. So uh, what, I, what I'm paying attention when I look at this here, if you're watching along with us, are the targets. 
Robert Lewis had eight. Cam Coleman had seven. Now, Cam caught the big touchdown pass from Peyton Thorne. Mm -hmm. And make no mistake, that was an elite catch. He had to adjust to an underthrown ball while fighting off a defender and caught it underneath. That catch was crazy. And, and while we were in the booth, I, it was hard to get a gauge for how crazy that catch was until we watched it on replay. But that's what Freeze talks about when he talks about the catch radius. Cam Coleman is the type of guy, just get the ball anywhere near him, and he may go make a play for you. Now, if you're a quarterback, you got to throw a better ball than that. right? That's not a play that you should be asking your receiver to make all the time. In my opinion, but well, if, you know, if if the DB was actually playing the ball, I don't know if Cam makes that catch. Yeah, if that's Georgia, that's an interception. But like you know, I mean, again, uh, against a a, I don't know. He almost caught one around somebody's back. I don't know how if the if the DB being able to make a play is gonna make much. Of, that uh, yeah. he different. He's different, man. I'm sorry. He's, he's like, different. He is yeah. different. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm just saying. Like I said, that's a low percentage execution type uh, 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 throw, and he can make that happen. But that's why you go out and you get a top yeah. five player in all of college football because they'll bail you out when things are less than perfect. Robert Lewis, it's clear, you know, we heard things about his speed in the preseason. We talked about it on the show. I think he showed it. He looked quick out there. He looked really quick. Uh, you can tell he's an experienced guy. And then when you look at the rest of this, Sam Jackson had a non-contact jersey on. He caught the only two targets that were thrown at him. Uh, uh, Jay Fair, they were trying at the outside in this game. Mm -hmm. Right, they were running a lot of the twelve personnel, so to get him on the field, you got to move him to the outside and out I mean, of the slot. The, yeah, because they were running twelve personnel, and there aren't enough non uh, enough scholarship wide receivers to play the outside. Right, like you really only have six. Cam you're Coleman, six. yeah, Robert Lewis, Cam Brown that are supposed to be outside receivers. So in mm -hmm. order to rotate the way that you need to at wide receiver, they had to move Jay Fair to the outside. This was, I. I <laughs> Again, I get it. We're we're we we defend Jay Fair too much, right? People are oh Sam Jackson's already taking Jay Fair's reps. No. Like Jay Fair was moved to the outside so that they could rotate more guys on the outside. Um so just to be clear about that. But I get I know I in the comments it's not gonna matter that I say that it's only gonna be that we're defending. Yeah, Jay Fair, also so. Jay as long <laughs> as well as others were dealing with nagging injuries this this spring. Again, you're not really trying to evaluate those guys, which is why I think you lean toward the other guys who have not been on this team to see if you can develop some depth and see what they have. To me, you know what Jay Fair can do. Um, Cam Brown, you know, maybe you know what he can do in practice because he was having this sort of spring last spring. And the question is going to be whether it can translate to games. Uh, on the tight end side, uh, there weren't a lot of – there wasn't a lot of focus on the tight ends in this one. Even though they were running 12 personnel, right? That is so you see here, Fairweather had one target. Mike O'Reilly had two targets. Uh, he caught one on a – like just a ricochet. Um, and then you have Frazier who had one target. Uh, am I missing anybody here that is sneakily a tight end? I, I don't think so. No, I think you got everybody. Yeah. So, you know, you're looking at it and you're thinking, all right, well, you're going to run a bunch of 12 personnel, but you didn't throw the ball to the tight ends very much. Again, all I take from that is is that they felt like they didn't need to evaluate the tight ends as much, so they spent more time trying to push the ball on the outside to the wide receivers. That's where Auburn failed the most last year, in my in my opinion, was on the outside trying to push the ball down the field. Uh, there was one to Jay. I think maybe it was Holden or Hank. They overthrew him pretty badly. It was like out of bounds. There was no chance to catch the ball. It was Holden. It was Holden, yeah. yeah. And so – yeah, uh, you're looking at it and you're just thinking, all right, well, at least there's some attempt to kind of push the ball down the field. And I think that they made 260 something attempts for Payne Thorne. Guys, that has to go up. And to and if for it to go up, you not only have to trust the quarterback, but you have to trust the receivers to go out and make plays. Now, now if we're looking at Cam Coleman, the type of catches he was making yesterday, you got to think. He might be good for plus five attempts for the quarterback during a game. If you were averaging 25 attempts a game last year and then you added Cam Coleman to your team, you're taking at least five extra shots. Oh, yeah. Down the field, right? So get it. That might get Peyton Thorne closer to the volume of attempts that he had at Michigan State plus five uh, a game. 
to uh, 30, 30 plus attempts a game. Because if the percentages hold true, you need that to get any yards in this offense. <laughs> and I fully expect that Peyton Thorne will be QB1 come game one. Whether he stays that way, you know, we'll see. But, I mean, if he's going to be the guy, I think you just have to give him more chances to make plays with his arm than 260-something in a season. That's definitely not going to work. When you get to the better teams, they're going to key in on what they think that you do well. And then, you know, uh, uh, every time it's like third and long and you're trying and you need a play, but you haven't passed the ball the whole, all game and everybody is going to say, look, man, the receiver didn't catch or the quarterback wasn't accurate. Well, they are. They're only throwing in obvious passing downs. It's going to be significantly harder. You have to create some like, you know, just Cam Coleman, just them respecting that deep throw guys like I know it was a spring game, but Cam Coleman kind of put the college, the SEC on notice. If your downfield coverage isn't good, we we can get you this year. We have and a guy. If it is. You. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. You could be perfect and the throw can be bad. And I'm still going to catch a 50 yard or four touchdown on you. And Perry Happy Thompson Thursday. and Perry Thompson still isn't here. Oh, yeah, man. I, I even saw hear him. you. I saw him outside the stadium for the game, right? So Perry comes up to me and right before I ran into Ike. He's like, what's up, Mike T? I was like, hey, listen, can we sit down and talk about how you're going to dominate at Auburn over the next four years? And he was like, sure. Look, you get this guy on campus and he he gives you a good backup plan midseason if some of your experienced guys aren't having a great season. So, you know, you know who didn't have a single target yesterday that we've been, you know, if you watch some other shows, they've been raving about him was Bryce Kane. Yeah. Not one target yesterday. And we warned people, listen, these young guys, you got to give them time to come along. Not a single target yesterday. And I think he's still I still think he's going to be really good. But it shows you where they're at and in, in, in their thinking about this wide receiver core. Uh, we were asked about, I uh, saw in the comments before we move on uh, to, to the break here, but Caleb Burton was injured. I expect him to factor into the to the, the passing attack yeah, in the fall. He had pads on, right? Like, yeah, he had on like a jersey and an orange shirt underneath. Like, so. Coy Moore, who is also battling injuries this spring. Yep. What do we expect to see? And again, I think that's what you're talking about, Mike, when you say the, the younger guys can be a good potential backup plan. Should we not see the production from some of the more experienced receivers in yeah. this group? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, look, man. Um, uh, you got veteran guys. You have to get healthy in the spring going into summer workouts so those guys can maximize their summer. And there, there's, there's some people out here you just don't want to risk it with. So you're hearing a lot of the other names, but I think that that's okay. You want to see what Sam Jackson can do. You want to see what Robert Lewis can do. You may actually you may need those guys. You know, Jay was dealing with injuries near the end of last season. Like, and, and, and when you're short-handed, like when you don't have depth and your game plan, it, it changes the way your game plan is once you start losing guys because you don't have the dudes out there who can execute. And plan B may not be as effective with the personnel that you have left. So hopefully this spring what they do is they develop a plan B that says, hey, man, what, what's our worst case scenario? And, and like, how can we operate if we're down to six scholarship wide receivers and we don't have a lot of depth? I, right. I liked what I saw from Robert Lewis in this game, though. Yeah, Just yeah I did His too. ability, like, after the catch, um, his adjustments to some passes. Um, he he is he's a, he's a guy that I think is going to be a – and this is going to sound like shading the guys that we got in the portal last year, but, like, actually looks like a good wide receiver portal pickup as opposed to what happened last season with those guys out of the portal that didn't contribute very much. Yeah. I don't expect Robert Lewis to come into that fold or into that um, light as far as the, the receiver pickups. He he looks like a quality pickup. at the And it kind of helps that they actually went through spring too, as opposed yeah. to a summer portal pickup yeah. with the receivers as well. So uh, I yeah, think I that, mean, that, there, there was, uh, there, there was a guy that came in last spring. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, he went, he went that there. is true. That is true. That is true. But again, it just helps. It Wait, helps. Who? You you can. <laughs> we're not part. doing that. We, we, yeah, yeah, we're not going to do that. Um, I'll be serious. Who was it? Martin. Yeah, I'll, I'll just type it to you. Martin. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Got it. <laughs> got it. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, we will we will discuss QP play uh, <laughs> in what we saw in, in a day. Right. We will discuss uh, QB <laughs> play in a day uh, when we come back for the break. But again, good conversation on 
uh, what we saw in terms of field goal kicking, running back, as well as receivers. We definitely want to hear from you in the comments, especially if you're watching on replay, your thoughts on what you saw in those mm. aspects of the game. Share this video, guys. Smash that like button and subscribe to our channel if you have just now found us. Go to pay some bills. Pause for, for a moment. Come back. And we're going to talk QB play. This edition of The War Report is brought to you by our generous sponsors. The Opelika Rage Room in Opelika, Alabama. The Rage Room is a place where anger and stress find their ultimate release. Call or text 334-777-6688 to set up a session today or check them out online at opelikaragerooom.com. Golden's Cast Iron. Whether you work out, grill out, or chill out, you deserve the best life possible, and Golden's Cast Iron is here to provide the tools to help you do it. Check them out at goldenscastiron.com. Thank you to all the sponsors of The War Report. Thank you to those of you who have continued to support us as members of The War Report. We are going to extensively get into this A-Day film in the coming weeks so have no fear your boy ike jones is here if you are green name gang look out for that content coming over the next couple of weeks we'll be doing this and probably in part so we'll try to focus in on certain things it's, it's the same film right but we're just going to look at it uh through the lens of different things uh coming up so be on the lookout for that if you are not a member maybe somebody will gift you a membership you get a free month of membership and they'll be able to do that if you are a member and you want to give the membership we appreciate that and then of course still continue to check out the guys on the network up tempo is going to have something i think later today about a day so they'll be giving their thoughts College Loop will be giving their breakdown at some point in time. And we'll be getting into more Just a Sec podcast stuff over the summer as we preview more of the rest of the SEC. So maybe be on the lookout for that stuff as well. All right, let me grab some comments real quick. Uh, Susan Scales, she's, this is in reference to doing the film <laughs> review on, on Alabama UConn. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Hate, hate, hate. Hey, so I'm yeah, for it that's, that's, yeah. Uh, do, that's that's I, I think the people are speaking on on. I, there are some on, people who said they don't want to see it. So I mean, listen, look, you, man. I mean, if you don't want to see it, then you don't have to. You don't have to tune uh, in. You, you, like you come and hold your eyes open in front of your uh, phone. UConn ended what I termed as a weeks long national emergency. <laughs> Every week, Bama advanced in this thing like. Angels were dying, guys. <laughs> like <laughs> puppies were getting dropped off bridges. This was terrible for our Pretty country dark. and for unity. And it was so awesome that, you know, when we needed God to show up, he delivered a Bama loss. And by the time you want them, right? Yeah, because we were losing things. It was like, first of all, it's like we've been to a final four y'all had. And then they made it. And now we can at least say, hey, we lost to the eventual national champions. And it took the refs. You got blown out because y'all were frauds. They were frauds. Bama, they were frauds, guys. They had a super easy path to the yeah, list. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, I don't want to get into it, but yes, they did. They got <laughs> gifted by their own athletic director on the committee. Mm, right. Come on, man. Anyways, enough that. Let's talk. Let's 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 get back to let's get back to the the A Day game. I want to talk about this and B definitely chime mm. in on this before we get into the stats for the QBs. Let's talk the rotation of how they handled the QBs. Mm. Typically, what we've seen in the past is QB1 goes out there for a few series, then followed by QB2, then followed by QB3. You typically don't see QB1 again in the spring game. They did it a little bit different this time where they rotated QBs in on different series, right? So next next QB went out there was Holden Gurner, followed by Hank Brown. You saw Walker White. Then they brought Peyton Thorne back. How did you guys feel about the rotation and how they handled the QB play this time? Oh, uh, it was interesting to me. Uh, look, uh, we didn't see we didn't see Holden Gurner in the third quarter at all. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't come out in the third quarter. I, I was trying. To me. Yeah, I turned. Ike, I was like, uh, where did Holden go? I, don't, I haven't seen him go in in the second half at all. Um, look, uh, they sent the guy out there first that I think that Freeze was sending a pretty clear message about, you know, what direction he's been going. And, you know, kudos to him for being transparent about what it is that they're doing. Uh, but ultimately, um, he got he got, everybody got enough reps, I think, to show what they could do. For sure. Everybody got enough reps to show what they could do, including the young guy. 
Walker White. I thought they had some interesting, along with the rotations, it seemed like at least Holden, Hank, and um, uh, Thorne got a chance to throw to the Cam Coleman's. Mm-hmm. I think they all had Coleman in their rotation at some point. And I was I was I was I was encouraged to see that. That, you know, hey, at least everybody got a chance to throw it on. Hank didn't waste any time. <laughs> he was just like second play, bombed Cam Coleman. And he laid out and he got one. So yeah, I, I don't know. We we got the stats here. Uh they'll probably will tell uh, a, a bigger uh a bigger picture of it. But yeah, we, we we will. We will. I, I want to just get everyone's thoughts on the rotation first before we get to the stats. Um Ike, how'd you feel about the how, how they handled like the rotation of the QBs? Big deal, no deal. No, I don't think it's a big deal. It's they they handled it like a scrimmage. Um and it, it wasn't – I mean, they, they put game scenarios to it, but it was like a scrimmage. They were just trying to rotate and make sure that there was that balance that Mike was talking about. It's like, all right, well, if we just give you a shot, give you a shot, give you a shot, there's no chance for this person to get, like, four. And then – because, you know, what would happen in previous uh, A-Day scenarios prior to Coach Hugh Freeze getting in here is you'd see one guy for two and a half quarters of the game, and then they try to shuffle through – three or four guys in the last quarter and a half and you right. barely got to see the backup or anybody else this way everybody gets a shot you know early in the day when people are still there because you know people start leaving at halftime and all this kind of stuff so uh it's it's good to rotate in that way so that you're just giving people opportunities now i know some people want to oh well it doesn't give people time to get in rhythm and look man just go out there and make throws bro you've been a qb for probably 20 years of your life at this point in time if you're holding Gurner. Um, Hank Brown, or Peyton Thorne, 23 probably. Just go make throws, man. Like I'm, all this, man, he needs time to get in rhythm. Like, no, you've been – rhythm, my foot. Boy, sh- just go play football, p- football, man. Like stop all this whining about rhythm. Play. Step up and play because it's, especially if you're a backup QB, you're going to be asked to go in there cold sometimes. Go make football plays and stop complaining. Mm. Thoughts B, any any other thoughts before we get into the stats? No, man. I mean, it wasn't exactly what anybody's gonna want to have if you've been selected as QB one and you're prep going into a game day, but this is not a game day. Yeah. You're gonna have opportunities to make throws. A play's gonna be called, players are gonna do what they do. Can you take advantage of the opportunity you're given? I mean, some did better than others, but that's the game. That's the game at this part of the season, especially at this part of the season. Like I said, it's a scrimmage. Yeah. And this this isn't the final determination of where you'll be come fall. That we're gonna have some more time to hash that out if they all stick around. But this was exactly what it should have been. I thought it was a good exercise in getting guys snaps much earlier than later in the game. Let's get into the stats as Mike G was uh, alluding to. Let's look at how they performed. Peyton Thorn tied with Walker White with the most attempts. Here he threw it. Not he completed nine of his thirteen passes for one hundred and thirty three yards, most passing yards. Through the only touchdown of the game to Cam Coleman, of course, followed by Walker White, who was 5 of 13, 83 yards. Uh, Hank Brown was 5 of 12 for 103 yards. Biggest, uh, biggest, I think he had the biggest completion uh, yes, of, of the game there. Uh, Holden Gurner, 7 of 10 uh, on, the, on the day. 49 attempts, guys. 49 attempted passes for 365 yards total. No one turned the ball over. So I'll start with I'll start with you, Ike, in terms of what you saw out of the QBs. What stood out to you? What are your impressions? Yeah, uh, first and foremost, uh, this I think Mike said this earlier. We saw what Coach Freeze had been saying is Peyton Thorne does look the most consistent of the quarterbacks. Uh but still some things that he needs to work on as far as accuracy, like he's behind on some attempts and things like that. Uh, you know, a little underthrown on the throw to, to, to uh, Cam Coleman for the touchdown. But again, I think the element that he brings then the other ones don't other than Walker white, but like, and I, and I don't expect Walker white to make some huge leap between now and spring to be in the QB two conversation, but he brings the legs. And so you, you don't get a chance to put that on display during this game in, in any real way. But, I'll say this, um, regardless of whether or not wide receivers made plays for Thorne or Thorne made great throws, the ultimate thing that I want to see is the pass game have completions. And if he's going to be able to, if we could extrapolate somehow 
this completion percentage to uh, the process of a full game, I'd absolutely take this from Peyton Thorne. 69%, nice, um, would be really good from <laughs> most quarterbacks, but especially from what we've seen from Peyton Thorne. Uh, so if he's going to be able to do that on a consistent basis, then you could, you could live with this. And again, I don't for me, I don't care if wide receivers made plays for him. Great, continue to make plays for him. I want to see the pass game be at this level of proficiency on a consistent basis. Uh, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna nitpick it today. I will when I get onto the film nitpick some things. But for today, just looking at the numbers on their face, it's okay. It's not great. It's not terrible. It's just okay. But I think you can live with okay from Peyton Thorne because I think our run game benefits that much more if you can continue to do this. Now, as far as the other ones are concerned, uh, Walker White, I think, showed some arm strength, but he still shows some freshmen out there of just where to go with the football uh, placement on certain passes. Hank Brown definitely showed the deep ball ability, right? Like second play. Let's just throw it up there and do it, right? That I love what I saw from his ability to just stretch the defense. Um, and then Holden Gurner, actually, he showed me a couple of passes with some zip as well. He he seemed like he was predetermining some stuff a little bit too much. But, you know, but again, overall, uh, you know, if I were ranking them, I'd put them in the same ranking that the coach did, which is Peyton Thorne should be QB1 right now. Mike G, your thoughts? Your uh, thoughts? Attempts, attempts were... Like I say, everybody got a chance to throw the ball. So I started at the bottom and worked my way up. Holden Gurner, seven for ten. I mean, he tried to push the ball down the field. Uh, I just think the difference between him and the others were they connected on at least one of their long passes, and Holden was not able to connect uh, on any of his long passes. So, you know, that that was something that I thought was uh, interesting there. Um, other than that, like you're, you're looking at the rest of this and you're thinking, all right, well, obviously Thorne is is was the guy. Right. They sent him out there to be the guy. He looked like the guy. And um, until that pass to Cam, though, these numbers were looking a little bit more pedestrian. Mm -hmm. And that's oh, the sure. thing that yeah. thing could that concerned me a little bit. I, I, what was it? I, was it 49 yards or was it 40 for his with the touchdown? Yeah. Uh, for, I think it was 49 on the touchdown. I don't remember. Honestly. Yeah, yeah. Not, don't let me uh, lie to you. But, you know, I'm looking at the, the stats there, and I'm just thinking, all right, well, you know, what, what do I make of that, right, um, looking at this one here? Yeah, the one to Coleman, long of 49, right, so uh, on, on the TD. So, yeah, it was a 49-yarder. You know, without that pass, you take away 50 yards from this. And it felt like Hank Brown was doing the best of the quarterbacks going into halftime. Uh, you know, Walker White, you know, I think he – guys, I think he struggled. Yeah, and I like Walker White a lot. I think he struggled yesterday. He looked like a freshman yesterday. But this feels like um, – it felt like that they wanted Holden – like Holden was – he felt like QB2 going into this the way they had been splitting up reps in practice and the way that they went out in this one they gave holding a chance to solidify qb2 I don't, I don't know if he did that yesterday i don't know if he did that yesterday so again seven of ten looks good in terms of completion percentage but um you know how did he he took a sack i think on one play where he just held on to the ball too he long was in the I, red zone. he was in the yeah red zone. yeah that <clears throat> bothered me a little bit but i'll, I'll let you continue yeah, we'll probably, you know, I'll talk about it on film. I won't get into it today. And then, you know, as far as Hank Brown is concerned, guys, I I personally think that Hank Brown is just a gamer. <laughs> throw out practice, right? Practice? Throw, throw it out. Right. Turn the lights on. Put Hank Brown in and let him cook. That's who, that's who I think Hank Brown is. I think that once he gets in the game, he just plays football. That throw to Cam Coleman, man, if he takes just a tiny bit off of it, Cam maybe scores. He doesn't have to go to the ground to catch that ball. But he he did what you're supposed to do. He laid it out there and he gave his you know five-star receiver a chance to go catch it. And we didn't see a ton of that down the field last year. So even though Thorns went for a touchdown, Hank threw the better deep ball. 
Yeah, right. I mean, he over. He, no, Damn, to, to be fair, he overthrew his right. Thorn underthrew. Yeah, his, that's. But, but Brown it, overthrew his. It, it just happens. Yeah, yeah. The, it just happens again. Overthrow, you got an eraser of a receiver in Cam Coleman extra, who can right. make that catch. Extremely underthrown ball versus a barely overthrown. <clears throat> he had to lay out completely to go get that one. Both of them were not he, great throws. No, he was on his feet. He was on his feet, and he, no, he, he was outstretched. He didn't. He didn't dive for it. Like yes, he, he, did. he was just. He was just, he was just <laughs> like this. Oh, I didn't think that was. I didn't think that was the best throw. I actually, he did. I didn't think he laid out. He didn't throw, right. for it. That was a better throw than Thorns by a long shot. Well, it, it was, was in that and underthrow. That play, that I'd, play. Re- I'd rather have an overthrow in that yes. scenario because the yes, DP sure. is not doesn't have a chance to make a play. To so me, for that, that play I had more to do with Cam Coleman than Hank Brown. In my, it opinion. was going to be Cam Coleman or nothing on Brown. That's what. That's why I say. That's I'll agree with you from that respect, but. He, well, that's it the only respect. Was it was a better throw. <laughs> it was a better throw. <laughs> okay. uh, so, uh, you know, when you're looking at it, uh, uh, both were caught. And like you said, Cam Coleman is just a playmaker. So uh, you expect that, though. And I, I want to give that back to Thorne. You know, it, it's you're not every throw is not going to be perfect. So you expect your receiver to go up and make some plays for your quarterback the same way you expect your quarterback to make some plays for their receivers at times. Um, but I thought that Hank Brown went out and showed that he can be a quarterback at this level. Honestly, um, and if I had to pick which one was going to be QB2 going into fall, based on what we've seen right now, I think maybe Hank snuck in there, but I, I have a sneaking suspicion they're going to go with Holden. I won't be mad at them giving either a shot, but, you know, Hank shouldn't be completely out of this conversation at all. And it felt like that's the no. way it was going this spring. You know, uh, it felt like – but, yeah, I thought that they they did a good job giving everybody an opportunity – to make plays. I did. I thought that they, I was worried that they might actually go too heavy on, on Peyton. And they didn't do that. And Peyton went out and I thought that he showed what he is capable of in the, in the reps that he got. He's an experienced guy. He shouldn't need half of a day to prove it. <laughs> yeah. that That's the one thing that I will say, I guess I'm the most disappointed in is that I, I've seen some people say that, Uh, excuse me, that Peyton Thorne was clearly the best quarterback out there. And I don't know that it was clear that he was the best quarterback out there during A-Day. I think he should have been, like, erase any doubt from everybody's mind. I'm making all the right decisions, all the right throws, because he's had the most time to prepare. He's had the most starts in collegiate game. Like, it should just be, like, there's just no doubt, man. This guy really gets the offense, and he's doing all the things, making all the right decisions. And I don't think I can say that from him, especially considering you're not really running anything super complicated. Right. Um, so I'd have to go back and look and see, all right, well, was he expecting receivers to be in places where they weren't? And maybe that was the contribution to some of that right. stuff, and we'll look at some of those things on film. But I just – I don't think that he put the – four years of experience separation between himself and the other quarterbacks in that room that he should have. Right. Um, and, and well, again, that's just, that's my opinion. On what when you I, look I at the defensive rotations, it, 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 it looks to me like Holden was actually throwing against the one D and he um, was. yeah, yeah, he was throwing against the, the, the better defense and, and, and Thorne was uh, throwing against second and third team depending on which rotations they had in there. So uh, that factored in a little to the numbers that you saw. Um, I couldn't tell. It was a lot happening really fast, uh, so I'm not sure which team Hank was throwing against. But again, sign up for a Patreon membership. I I will go over that in the film review. Uh, so it wasn't exactly apples to apples in terms of what they were going up against. But you know, like I said, they all had an opportunity, and like you said. You just got to go out and play ball. No more whining about when I go out and what, you know, because like if you're coming off the bench in a game, you're going to have to go in cold. You're going to have to go in cold and be ready for your moment when it comes. And we've seen that time after time at other schools where they're doing it better than Auburn. It's just time for Auburn to be in a place where there's more than one guy who could do the job. So what, what's the takeaway? If you're a, if you're an Auburn fan who watched the A Day game, what should you be taking away from the spring game yesterday? Just, well, Mike has been trying to tell us this for the last few months, but Peyton Thorne's going to be the starter. He just is, and you can be excited about Walker White, but he's going to be redshirted if at all possible because he's not going to be second on the depth chart. This is going to be the pecking order. You have a reason to be excited about the wide receiver talent that we have here and still coming in. Mm-hmm. But 
this is not the year where you get to see your quarterback of the future just have some crazy – like, this is not that year. And I think that's okay. To, to If you're asking me what I'm going to get from this A-Day game, all right, Peyton Thorne's going to be my starter. We got some wide receivers that can bail him out and make great plays, so that's a plus. The run game, they I think the coaches expect it to be just as good or better than it was, or else they would have worked on it more. And maybe we're a little ahead of the curve when it comes to, you know, the defensive front. Um, we might be, maybe, perhaps, a little further. And we never thought that we were bad. We just thought we were thin, and they've got to find the guys, the right mix of guys. And maybe that's a little – we're on track there. That, that's what I get out of the A-Day game. Yeah, I would say that um, – I talked about this with Pate uh, on the mix. Like, you know, what do you take away from A-Day? Uh, remember last year when um, – Bama's quarterbacks all look like crap during the spring game, and everybody's saying, Bama doesn't have a quarterback. And they had a guy just miss the Heisman ceremony, <laughs> right? Um, now, did Jalen Miller have the best year? No, he did not. But um, there was not as much cause for panic the way that they managed it. As a matter of fact, they benched him. I think, uh, what game was it be that they benched After him? After the Texas game. South Florida. Florida. South Florida, yeah, yeah. The, and they gave they gave Buckner a chance to go out there and, and and prove that he could be the guy, and he didn't. And they went back right back to Milrow and just kept it pushing and figure it out a game plan that worked for him. It turned out to be like twenty six hundred yards plus eight hundred on the ground. Like you know, it was good enough to get the job done in terms of winning the conference. So you know that what you know what I take away from this is is that they're going to at least try to pass the ball more than they did last year. I think it's clear they're going to try to push the ball down the field and they feel like they have a couple of playmakers who they can trust to go up and make the right, bigger play for their quarterback more so than they they had last year. Now, those guys, they, they, you know, Ike was trying to spare their feelings, but, you know, shorter who's, and who's hook. got. Oh, OK. I was about to say, who's got what guys am I <laughs> spare feelings? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shorter and hooks so were didn't work out. Yeah. I just, I, I just wasn't mentioning their name. They ain't about sparing their feelings. They ain't yeah, 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 okay, no fair enough. Uh, but <laughs> they're, not bring, an, they're not in an Auburn uniform, so as far as Ike's concerned, yeah. Yeah, I just think you bring Cam Coleman in, and he's already better than either of those two as a freshman. That's how good he is. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's already better. So you get better on the outside with a guy like Cam Coleman who can go out and make a play better than you were last year. Mm. And they, they and because it's Freeze's guy, he's going to give him every opportunity to do that. They took the air out of the football last year, guys. They, 266, I mean, bottom of the league in attempts, completions, yards, you know what I mean? Everything, every category there was. They were bottom of the league in terms of the passing game, and I know for, Hugh Freeze knows I can't stay there. So I need to focus on getting this passing game, you know, 25 to 30% better year over year. If that seems like a lot, it, it when the bar is on the floor, that that those gains should be exponential. If you're the worst in the league, you need to be like middle of the pack next year. Middle of the pack passing game wins Auburn eight games. I'm not sure they're going to be there. So, you know, I set their ceiling at seven wins because yeah, you know, there's just there are a lot of factors involved in this, and you're not the only team that's trying to get better. It's not like everybody else is just sitting around on their hands saying, oh, you know what? Auburn got better, so we'll just stay right here so they pass. <laughs> you know, it's, I think that, you know, I wouldn't overreact to anything good or bad that I saw in this game. Correct. You know, and I think that that's my takeaway. There, there's some potential there in the passing game for them to be better. There's some potential in that secondary for them to make plays, and there's some potential on that D-line for them to, you know, uh, generate a pass rush and, and maybe cause some havoc uh, to help this team out. They just got to continue to work on that. And nothing you saw yesterday says Auburn's going to be really good or really bad. And I think there's some things maybe to worry about, but certainly. I'm a little worried about that offensive line in multiple aspects. But they've got time to pull that together. Those aren't all freshmen they got on that line there. You know, yeah. Dylan Wade and those guys can take the next step, then, you know, they might be a little bit better. And if not, then the scheme has to cover their weaknesses. Ike, any thoughts before we get to some of the comments? Uh, I mean, as far as what Auburn fans should take away from this is that you've got some playmakers at wide receiver and you've got some some gamers, especially like we didn't talk a lot about it. I loved what I saw from the linebacking core mm -hmm. um, on yes. defense. Yes. Um, and I have not been able to say that for 
I, I mean, I said it at points last season, but I haven't been able to go into a season in spring and say, I like what we have at linebacker in a while. Um, and so definitely like the fact that he has uh, in Coach Freeze and Coach Durkin put together some enough talent in some places where Auburn needed talent um, just to be able to – because your linebackers and your wide receivers are really your makeup guys, right? Yeah. Like they're the guys that make up for the fact that, okay, maybe you don't have the best defensive line. You got an eraser at the second level at linebacker. Maybe you don't have the best quarterback, best run game. You've got, you've got a guy that you just throw it up there and he erases mistakes, right, at wide receiver. Auburn hasn't had erasers in the last few years at those positions, yeah. Yeah. and they've got a couple of erasers right now. And so that's the thing that you can look forward to saying, hey, we've got some bailout happening at a couple of spots that will allow you to be a little bit better than you anticipated. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, there is definitely some – uh, opportunity. We ran into Peyton Thorne, uh, Caesar, after the game outside the stadium, and uh, I got. I asked him like, how how beneficial was it to be able to actually go through spring this year? And he said it was a relief to be able to go through spring and kind of get to know his guys in the spring and work with these guys in the spring. It's tough coming in after the the, uh, uh, the spring period and then having to play catch up on a lot of things. So if he feels more confident up here going into it, I think that I would have a little bit more confidence about what the result will be because so much of this game is mental. And now that he's settled in, hopefully uh, you know he could be the guy he was at Michigan State and maybe even a little better. Let's get to some of the comments here. Uh, Matthew McTurnan, appreciate you being here with us, man. It says he comments saying can't hate on Thorne for his performance yesterday. Nine of 13 for 133 yards and a touchdown. Four rushes for 20 yards. Made the right read almost every time. Freeze taking over. The offense was good for him. Yeah, Freeze said that he felt like the decision making was solid yesterday. Like, you know, in terms of evaluating the quarterbacks. Um, I, I don't think the quarterback turned the ball over yesterday. No, right. they did not. Oh, no, no turnovers yesterday. Watch the film, though. Watch the film. Uh, I'm curious to see uh, Ike's thoughts on a couple of plays uh, that we saw of all the QBs, not just the one. I mean, but yeah, no, all the QBs, every last all one. the QBs. So we'll just see how that how that plans out when we take a deeper dive into that for sure. But again, nine of 13, 133 yards, t- touchdown, four rushes. To your point, Matthew, can't hate on that. Uh, J.J. Brand says, year after year, A-Day offensive showing has almost zero correlation to the offense we see during the regular season. Remember how Cam Newton looked at A-Day. People, relax. Yeah, I agree with that, man. It was like, what do we take from that? Absolutely nothing. Yeah. Right. There was nothing to take from A-Day that year. Steve Bradley, he asks, so what position or positions does Coach Hugh Freeze go after in this next portal? I think he already I mean, he, I about to say, he answered this question in yeah. the post-game presser, mm-hmm. which is he's going to be going after defensive line and wide receiver because he knows he needs more depth in both of those rooms. Yeah, um, I'd be surprised if there's any – unless there is a departure from the quarterback room, I don't think he's going to go after a quarterback. I know a lot of people are like, oh, we need to go to the portal. I don't think that that's going to happen unless no, there I is a departure it. from the QB room. I don't um, think they go if there is a departure. I think that's why you get Sam Jackson. He's kind of two and one. Possibly. You don't ever think you want to or you, be back you to elevate your somebody like a you know Jackson Barkley off your um, you know I don't know right. So I don't know yeah. what's going to happen there, but I, I, I just don't see it happen. The problem you have with going after a portal quarterback is that you're not going to get a quality portal quarterback that doesn't anticipate actually being able to come in and compete as a starter. And I don't think that that's the direction coach Hugh Freeze wants to go is go and get a starter at QB in the second portal window, because they tried that last season and it didn't, it just didn't give enough time for them to really get that guy in and acclimate it the way they wanted to. So I don't foresee it happening this time. Um, it, and then there's just a lot of investment that has to happen in that person, unless you're going to go get a young person and then Which you, you definitely risk, don't want to do that. Right. You're right. upsetting the possibility of Walker White feeling like he's secure and where he is. Hank and Holden don't feel good about where they are if you go get that person. And then yeah. you got to try to still get a 25 QB. That doesn't right. make a ton of sense. So I don't see quarterback happening. So let's just turn the page on that and figure out what you have in your room and push forward with that. Um, wide receiver, uh, uh, defensive line are where they're going to focus in this portal period. Greg Wheatley says, I noticed Walker White has a lot more zip on his throws and he gets the ball out quick as opposed to Peyton Thorne, who scares me to death on throws into the flat. And he is still indecisive. Walker has um, definitely come along. He's made progress this spring from first practice until now. 
Uh, but again, still a long way to go. And that's what you expect from most freshmen, though. He's continuing. To, he's a student of the game. He's working hard at the, you know, studying uh, this offense. They put in, with, he talked about the terminology, right? They've gone back to Freeze's old terminology. Freeze said they've gone all the way back. So they are all the way over. And the players have said that it's a little bit, it's easier to digest and understand, which mm-hmm. should lead to, to faster, more reactive play on the field uh, here. So Walker is benefiting from that right now. He doesn't have anything to unlearn. So uh, it's right. good that he's coming in here, you know, on the front end of this. But yeah, like Walker is going to be a good quarterback. He's going to be a good quarterback, just not for Auburn this year. TK says Hank was the only QB that didn't have a recorded sack in yesterday's eight days. He gets the ball out of his hands pretty He's quickly. Slanging yeah. that thing. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that's, he that, does. That, I, that's probably the biggest thing that he does that none of the others do is he is ext- whether he's right or wrong, he's Very extremely decisive. decisive. Yeah, yeah. He yeah, decides he's where he wants to go with the football and he's gonna let it go. Mm-hmm. Like consequences be damned. I'm I'm throwing the ball here. Right? right. And, you know, his, his the accuracy was a little on and off at some points with that. The decision making was a little on and off. But I actually like that from the quarterback, especially in this system. Yep. Look, man, I'm not going to run the ball. So I need to get the ball out of my hands. Um, so, you know, he, he needs to com- improve in his consistency of of placement of where he's getting those throws. And sometimes mm-hmm. the pre snap decision or pre deciding where he wants to go, he's got to get yeah. out of that habit. Yeah. But man. Yeah, he he's going he, when he gets to the back foot of that drop. That ball's going somewhere, whether it's going to the stands <laughs> or going to a receiver. He's not going to stand there and take sacks for you like, yeah. No. Again, in an uh, with with a QB that's not that mobile, that's what you like to see. Right. James Barnett, appreciate the $5 super chat. My good buddy, uh TK says Peyton Thorne didn't look totally awful, therefore he's still the guy. That's a low bar. Uh I mean, so here's the thing, right? Like I don't know that that's necessarily a low bar, but if it's a low bar and nobody else climbed over it, what does that say about everybody else in that room? Right. Like it, it, you can't convince me anybody has eclipsed that bar, whether it's a low bar or not, it it being set that low and nobody gets above it. That validates the fact that you need to stay where you are with that. And I get, you know, maybe you give somebody else an opportunity because they have the potential for their ceiling to be higher. I'm not right. against that. Again, this this is not me advocating Peyton Thorne definitely should be the quarterback. I'm saying I can understand why he is. Yeah, I, I would argue that the bar being as low as it is is not completely on the players. I think that the coaches had a, st- a hand in setting the bar that low. So when you're talking about raising the bar and people eclipsing it, right, like, you know, they've got to help them to that mark. So, you know, even for Thorne or whoever the quarterback is, so yes, the bar it was low. He had a hand in setting it low because you're not, you're not. If seventeen hundred yards passing is got a lot to do with how the position is played, but it also has to do with how it's called. Right again, he's not out there calling his own pass plays. Hopefully, <laughs> so uh, two hundred and sixty six attempts is you know those are called plays that had. A, a a a hand in setting the bar as low as it was now they have to pick it up and i think that that's on everybody i don't think that that's just on the quarterbacks in the room terry ogle comes back and says i'm kind of confused by some of our fan base i think it's pretty clear peyton doesn't have to be great for us to win eight to nine games we were three touchdowns away from nine wins and now we have some serious weapons on offense yeah i would i i'm gonna i'm gonna challenge this for a second um Depending on other factors, he may not have to be great. So if other parts of your team are run, like if you've got a great run game and and the defense plays like it did last year, then maybe, right? But depending on how other parts of this team comes along, he may have to be great for them to win eight or nine games. Terry, which three games are you talking about? I know Bama's would have won us another touchdown to Bama. Georgia, no, we got blasted by New Mexico State. 21 point loss. Touchdown. Okay. So Georgia and Bama, a touchdown in those games would have won it. However, what's the what's the other one? You said eight or nine. You said eight oh, he's just eight or nine. Eight or nine. That's right. That's right. I'm thinking nine, but you're right. You're right. Two more for sure. He said eight. So that's that's that's. He said three TDs away from nine wins. So 
Yeah. Oh, the um, ball game. Or, well, not the ball game. No, we got blasted in that game. I got blasted. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, yeah I'll, I mean, I'll, so here I, I'll agree with Terry because this is what I've kind of been saying for years about Auburn is that you don't have to have a Heisman quarterback in order to go out and win eight or nine games. You just need somebody who's going to take care of the football and get the ball to your playmaker. So you don't need him to be great to win. You just need him to be good. Here's the problem. He wasn't good last year for whatever right. people want to say about everybody else. He wasn't good last year with the weapons that people didn't feel like were good with the offensive line with the block he was not a good quarterback last year and that contributed to Auburn only winning six games last season so yes if Peyton Thorne can be good this season Auburn has the potential to win eight or nine games this season but the mark or the bar regardless of all the other extraneous things that are not around Peyton Thorne's play specifically he has to raise his level of play he just does um, yeah, okay. And okay. he showed the ability to do that at some points in time. And he's shown the ability in his career to do that. You just need to see him do it at all. Oh, yeah. Qualifying this a little bit more like in, in Georgia's first title run, they didn't they didn't need Stetson Bennett to be great to, to right. win like they won. But right. that's because so many other parts of their team were was spectacular. Amazing. Was right. Amazing. So yeah. whether or not you need Peyton Thorne to be great to win eight or nine games, it depends on the other factors around him. How good is the defense? It, How good is the run game? How good is the play calling? If your, those your teams team are did, not great, right. <laughs> you may need him to be great to win eight or nine games. We just don't know what that's going to look like that year. So I'm not ready to say that you don't need him to be great this year to win eight or nine games. I, I just I, I think that's a lot to ask of him to be great, seeing as what he showed us up to this point. I think it's the yeah. whole playmaker versus game manager argument, right? Right. Yeah. Game manager can be a bit of a curse word, but – if the conditions are right for it and you just have a guy who can manage the offense, make the right plays, make the right reads and get the ball into your playmaker's hands, then you got a good offense to get the job done to where you can win the necessary games. Yeah, I'm I just want to know if Peyton Thorne can be a game manager yeah, instead I of a guy who they've had to manage last year. I think this comment just assumes that all the other factors around him will, will, will be where they were last year. We don't know that they might actually regress defensively. Over where okay, I, I see what you're saying. You're yeah. saying that if Peyton Thorne, uh, you know, can play well and everybody else is still raising their level, then we don't need him to raise his. But yeah, I, I think regardless of improvement in anything else, Peyton Thorne needs to raise his level of play. Correct, which is what we said about Stetson Bennett. Remember, and the Georgia guy was arguing with us. Hey, to repeat, he's going to have to be much better than he, he was became a playmaker. Before. Yeah, yes. and and they were like, this guy, I forgot what the guy's that Johnny or something, he came in, he was like, oh, Danny, Danny, he was like, you don't know what you're talking about, Mike G, our defense. Now, listen, he wasn't totally wrong about their defense. They were really good. The problem, is, again, but the teams that they played, a lot of those guys got better. If Stetson Bennett isn't super Heisman Stetson Bennett, they lose to Ohio State, guys. Yeah. That was a straight shootout, and C.J. Stroud showed up. Stetson mm -hmm. had to be much better than he was. There were games in that first championship run. They didn't let him throw 12 passes in the game. Right. That Stetson Bennett was nowhere to be found in the next year. He was slinging it, and it felt almost inevitable that if they needed a play, Stetson Bennett was going to make it. Yeah. He protected the football. He was much better, and I think that that's what you hope to see from Thorne. Go from a guy who you managed you know, to the tune of not a lot of throws – to a guy that you just go out there and trust to make every single play you need him to make. I don't, now, again, again, he's, again, just an experienced guy, an older guy, a more mature guy. Yeah, I, I think that that's not unreasonable to want that from him. But there are a lot of factors that factor into that. Like I said, Stetson Bennett, man, his defense got him the ball. If he needed the ball back, the defense was like, <laughs> Stetson, we got you. As a matter of fact, I think that was a right. sound bite from that season. They're like, don't worry, we're going we're gonna to get the football for you. And then yeah. two plays later, it was a pick. <laughs> and the guy came over to, I forgot which Georgia play. He was like, see, I told you I was going to get you the ball back. <laughs> uh, I, I think, you know, Thorne has to raise his game, like Ike said. But also, you know, everybody else needs to raise their game around him, too, because it's not just, you know, hey, if he raises his game, we'll win eight or nine games. No, man, you could have a lot go wrong in other areas that make it almost impossible. You, and you'll have a lot of pretty losses. Yeah. The whole I the hope is that those conditions are right yeah. for him to be, you know. Yeah, for I understand. Sure. I understand. We don't know. <laughs> we can't tell in, in April what's what it's going to be. Yeah, yeah we, we have no clue. The, 
you hope the conditions are right to where you're not asking him to have to be this exceptional elite player at the QB position. Yep. Good conversation, y'all. Uh, Ike, tell the folks how to get a green name so they can check out your film review, sir. Just click that join button, decide which level you want to participate for my supporters. You get to watch the live stream. And I keep, I usually keep it up for like a couple of hours, maybe 24 at most. Uh, patrons, you can watch that whenever. You can go right now and go watch all of the film from last season that's still up somewhere on that watch the film uh, playlist for you all. Um, but yeah, we want everybody to be able to be a part of those conversations. We'll definitely appreciate everybody who continues to support us during the off season. This is when we're going heavy film, man, because we got to try to preview some stuff. And now I have some film of the current players on the team to look at. So we will dissect this film as many ways as possible. Uh, so we're not going to do traditional watch film where we just go through the whole game and, and watch every single play. Uh, we'll we'll watch every play, but we're going to watch it from different perspectives. So I think the first thing that we're going to do. Let's just go look at every throw from Peyton Thorne. Let's do that this week. So if you want to get in on that film review, make sure you get your membership up and active. If you are a member and you want to gift a membership before you get out of here, you can do that. And someone will get a free month of membership to the War Report. And if you want to hear some different perspectives, maybe you don't, you know, you don't like what the what, what we are saying over here. Somebody on the network might have something that you want to hear. So uh, up tempo podcast, college loop, all they're giving different perspectives. Plus, they are doing things on baseball and softball right now, which is what season is going on. Baseball struggling right now but uh hopefully there's a lot of baseball left in this season they can uh turn this around for them but uh, you can get in on all of that stuff over there on the war report podcast network and before you get out of here please share this video smash that like button subscribe if you're new to the channel guys we're on social media in case you didn't know you can find us on twitter x at the war report or ig at the war report you can also find us on tiktok at tw rapport it's it for now guys we will catch you tomorrow with the morning drop probably be talking more about a day moving forward for this auburn team i has done a good job leading up to a day covering the different position groups so be sure to keep it locked and loaded in the mornings for the morning drop as he's covering various auburn topics around your favorite football team it's it for now guys We'll definitely catch you throughout the week. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. And as always, where you go? Where you go?